Hi, my name is Barry Rubin, and I'm the medical director of the Peter Monk Cardiac Center. Joining me today is Dr. Sanjo Kalra, an interventional cardiologist and part of the team working in the Susan Lenke Kerwin Cardiac Catheterization Laboratory, a high tech laboratory designed to do very difficult, minimally invasive heart artery procedures. Welcome, Sanjog. Thanks very much, Barry. It's great to be here. For those who don't know, Sanjog is a world leading expert in the treatment of heart arteries by a minimally invasive approach. Can you tell our audience what that is? Sure. Unfortunately, over time, people get narrowing of their heart arteries and those narrowings cause a reduction, a decrease in the blood supply to the heart. The heart needs blood. And so when heart artery narrowings happen in really important places, the heart pump function can go down and patients can get symptoms like chest pain or shortness of breath. When those heart artery blockages happen in really important places or multiple places or are located in very difficult to reach spots, that makes them complex because of the things that we have to do to get those types of artery narrowings open. And so an expert in complex heart artery disease, so-called complex coronary interventions, is someone who's versed in using the most modern tools and techniques and approaches to be able to get patients the very best results that they can get. And what makes these procedures risky? That's a great question. So anytime you work on a heart artery, anytime you try to open up a heart artery blockage, you're instrumenting, you're manipulating the heart. And when heart artery blockages are in those really difficult places, when they're anatomically difficult to get to, or when they're 100% blockages, you have to instrument the heart in various more aggressive, more modern, more cutting edge ways that can sometimes result in a decrease in the blood flow to the heart during the procedure. In patients who have that kind of complex heart anatomy, combined with poor heart function to begin with. So people whose hearts are already not functioning all that well and need all of the blood that, it can, that they can get, when you combine those two factors and add in an, even a third factor, which is underlying body diseases, underlying what we call medical comorbidities, things that can make the ability to withstand any procedure higher, so things like chronic kidney disease or liver disease, when you combine all three of those circles, you get the classical complex and high risk patient where we have to use special techniques, technologies, and teams really to get the very best results possible. Sounds like a risky business, uh, but I know that you're great at it. We have quite a few questions from the audience. Uh, I'm gonna start to go through some of those. And if anybody has any questions, uh, no problem to write in and we'll try our best to respond to those. Awesome. So the first question, what are the reasons why some people develop blocked heart arteries and at what point are those narrowed arteries dangerous? That's a really good question. And I think it's important for us to focus on the idea that heart artery narrowing or coronary artery disease has the same five major causes across the world. You know, this knowledge came from the Vietnam War. When soldiers would die in the field, they would come back and they would get autopsies. And even in their early 20s, they were noted to have some degree of heart artery disease. That formed the basis of a study that actually defined five major risk factors for developing heart artery disease. It happens in smokers, it happens in people who have diabetes, it happens in those who have high cholesterol, and it happens in those who have high blood pressure. And then, of course, there are some people, just because of their genetics, how they're built, that are at higher risk of developing heart artery disease. People who are African Canadians, for example, South Asians, for example, Hispanics, for example, are amongst the higher ethnic groups that develop these problems. They can become life-threatening when they happen all of a sudden. So when the heart isn't prepared, that's commonly termed a heart attack. When an artery suddenly blocks off, that can be life-threatening. Other times these things can be life-threatening is when there are many blockages in all three of the heart's major arteries, or if they're in really critical places within the heart's artery system, where they're blocking off blood to many walls of the heart. Those types of blockages can become threats to, the, to life eventually. 
So this is, uh, I think, a really great follow-up question to that question. I have narrowed heart arteries, but I don't have any symptoms. Should I be getting a stent to fix those arteries, even though I don't have symptoms? Wow, so that's a really good question. And that comes down to actually some of the most recent evidence that we have. When we look at heart artery narrowings, generally speaking, the reason people get imaged, the reason people come to medical attention because of heart artery disease is because they have a heart pumping function abnormality or they have symptoms. But in individuals who maybe have had an angiogram that shows some heart artery narrowing that's not all that severe or plaque on a CT scan, but they have no symptoms and they have normal pumping function, that's the perfect place for us to focus on medication therapy and lifestyle therapy. Those are the therapies that really make a difference for those types of people. So you talked about symptoms. I think everybody or most people know that a symptom of narrowed heart arteries is chest pain. What other symptoms could people have? Because it's not always chest pain. Absolutely, absolutely. Sometimes people present with heart artery disease with symptoms of shortness of breath, particularly shortness of breath when they're going up the stairs or going for walks or pushing themselves physically, perhaps more than they usually do. Sometimes we tell, sometimes we hear people say when they go outside in the cold that they feel a tightness in their chest. That tightness often makes us wonder if there's a lack of blood flow because that's what that's the kind of sensation that the heart causes when it's not getting adequately supplied. And there's a variability in those symptoms as well. Sometimes people will complain of heaviness or squeezing in the shoulder, in the arm, even burning in the ears. The important thing is when you feel that your body is doing something not quite right, right? When you feel like something doesn't feel right, it's important to get checked out, to get medical attention. And do women and men get the same type of symptoms? So often women have been cited as presenting with more atypical symptoms than men. So men more typically present with chest discomfort or chest heaviness with heart artery disease, particularly when that heart disease is acute. So it happens suddenly. But women will often present with less typical symptoms like shortness of breath, or even in the case of 100% blocked arteries, so-called chronic total occlusions, symptoms of shortness of breath and fatigue, much more than chest discomfort or a lack of energy. And that's why we need to know our bodies, think carefully about how our bodies function and what we know about ourselves. And we need to see our doctors regularly, our family doctors, our internists, et cetera. And I understand that even sometimes the symptoms can be atypical, like indigestion could actually be a sign of having heart problems. So there has to be a high index of suspicion. You have to suspect that, wow, if something's not right, I really should get checked out. Absolutely. We often have patients coming in and the emergency department saying, gee, I just thought it was a big meal. The key is every one of those patients says, you know, I was pretty sure something was wrong, but I figured that. And so the key here is listen to your body. Nobody knows your body better than you do. You've been living in it for years. And so when something seems clearly off, when you know that this is not something you felt before or you felt it, but it's really not going away, that says an alarm bell to say, I need to seek medical attention, whether it's about your heart or anything else. So if you are going to seek medical attention, what's new in the treatment of narrowed heart arteries? Well, narrowed heart arteries now we realize comprise a really big spectrum of problems. You can have the acute narrowed heart artery syndromes, the so-called heart attacks where arteries suddenly block off, or the ones where there's slow-growing bra blockages that are not well treated with medications that need stents open. And then there are more complex blockages, those that are packed with calcium in the walls of the arteries, or those that are 100% blocked instead of 80 or 90%. Those are the types of blockages that require specialized tools and techniques, like some of the ones we have here at the Peter Mount Cardiac Center. You may have seen we did a procedure on someone not too long ago who had very severe calcium in their heart arteries. And this patient was unique because she had already had bypass surgery. And that's, th those are some of the most complex patients we treat because their heart artery disease tends to be amongst the most complex you get. The, the blockages are early in the heart artery tree and they're full of calcium. So we performed a procedure called orbital atherectomy, which is a new mode of treating calcium inside the heart arteries that 
uh, was the first time it was done in Canada using a special tool that actually cores the calcium out of the artery and lets us make sure that we can open that artery to as big a size as we can before putting our stents in. That's the way you get the very best results. So, so everybody understands, this is a drill. It's going 50,000 rotations a minute, and it's in an artery that's two or three millimeters wide. So this is not for everybody. Yeah. What, um, or for everybody, who can act, not everybody can actually do this type of procedure who's a cardiologist. Sure. What other types of special techniques have you brought to the Peter Monk Cardiac Center that allow us to treat patients who otherwise might have been told, you know, I'm sorry, there's no treatment for this? Right. That's a good question. I think I'm really happy to be part of the Peter Monk Cardiac Center team because we all work together and we all use one another's inputs to get our patients the very best results. Some of the things that we can offer through our complex and high-risk PCI program or our complex and high-risk interventional program is opening up arteries that are 100% blocked, so-called chronic total occlusions that are lesions or that are blockages that cause really bad symptoms like the fatigue and shortness of breath. These types of blockage, blockages and the procedures needed to open them are the bastion of specialized operators who know how to use both the heart's own tiny bypasses as well as the normal arteries themselves and their entire structures to get the artery open. That's a unique skill set in which I've had formal training as part of my complex and high-risk training some years ago. One of the other important areas that I think we focus on now is zero contrast or ultra low contrast PCI. We're able to provide heart artery procedures to patients by using very, very little intraarterial contrast, the type of dye that we use to see the arteries under the the radiation camera that we need to do these procedures. Contrast dye is toxic to kidneys, but using some of the newer tools and techniques we have at our disposal, special wires that can measure blood flow down arteries, special cameras that you actually put inside the artery to be able to image the artery wall, we can actually perform these procedures with almost no contrast at all. And as a result, open up the envelope of treatment to a group of patients that we have evidence doesn't get offered the treatment they need out of concern for the risk around the procedures. The key for us is providing the best procedure safely. And that's why so, we do well. So it's really incredible. You can put a camera inside a blood vessel that's two or three millimeters. You can put other devices in that measure how well the blood is flowing because sometimes the picture and the actual blood flow, they can tell you a different story. Absolutely. And this is extremely important because it's very common for our patients who have significant heart disease to have kidney disease. And the last thing you'd want to do is you give somebody dye to do the heart artery procedure and they go from having sort of bad kidney disease to being complete kidney failure and needing dialysis. So I could see where this opens up the ability to treat patients who otherwise uh, might be told, you know, your kidneys aren't so good, your heart's not so good, maybe we should leave this alone. That's right. This whole concept is something called renalism, where uh, patients who have chronic kidney disease, one quarter of the time, so one out of four patients who have chronic kidney disease are not actually referred even for urgent heart artery procedures out of concern that we're going to make their kidneys worse because Doctors recognize that making kidneys worse, putting people on dialysis is a really, really bad outcome for patients. And that's why these new techniques are so critically important because these are patients, unfortunately, because of their kidney disease, they are also amongst the highest risk to get coronary disease, to get heart artery blockages. And because they so commonly have them, these types of techniques to be able to provide them the right care, to be, to be able to provide them opening of the heart artery blockages are so important. And that's why it's so important to be able to make the whole medical community aware of these advances, because you're an expert in this area, but it may be that others haven't heard about this. There's patients that aren't getting treated. So it's really important to get the message out that, you know, there's very few situations that we can't treat. That brings me to another question. There must be some that you say, you look at the heart arteries and you say, you know, I can't treat that. Uh, or maybe I can treat some of them, but not others. What other options are there in that setting? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And that's one of the reasons that makes me most proud to be here, to be honest. When we approach patients, whether it's 
because of complex heart artery disease or complex heart pump function, the indication to treat is there. So just because it's harder, it doesn't mean that the indications change. It means it's our responsibility to make sure that we get our patients the care that they need, whether it's our own hands or someone else's, right? Our allegiance is to, is to the experience of our patients. And, and one of the things that I really enjoy is a great partnership with my surgical colleagues. Now, we have a special program here, a hybrid revascularization program, where I partner with one of my surgical colleagues in particular, Dr. Piroz Dagarwala, who's a, a minimally invasive cardiac surgeon who's joined us recently from the, the world-famous Leipzig Heart Institute. The best, uh, the best opportunity that we have to collaborate is around hybrid revascularization procedures where, at mm -hmm. times, providing very long segments of stent are maybe not ideal. And instead, he can do a minimally invasive bypass to one of the arteries, and I can do stents to the other arteries to provide patients arguably the best of both worlds. So please explain for everybody, what does minimally invasive heart surgery mean? I think heart surgery, I think big incisions, and it doesn't seem like those two phrases necessarily go together. Yeah, the beauty is this is 2022. And the, the only wrong thing to do is stand still, right? We are always trying to push the envelope. So Dr. Dagarwala um, can perform minimally invasive bypass surgery where through a small five centimeter incision along the chest wall without putting the patient on a heart lung machine, without stopping the heart, can actually sew an arterial graft beyond a heart artery blockage onto the main artery that goes on the front wall of the heart. In some respects, he can actually even do the same through a small incision on the right side of the chest to get one of the other arteries, if appropriate. And so that small five centimeter incision means that the recovery period is a lot faster for those types of patients and is allowing us to engage in combined procedures where, for example, the patient that was done today, he does a bypass procedure through that minimally invasive incision on a, on a Tuesday or a Wednesday, that patient is taken off any sort of breathing support and is awake and feeling fine that same day, maybe an hour after surgery. And then two days later comes to me in our cardiac catheterization lab, gets everything else fixed just right using the most modern stance cameras technologies and goes home in four days after they came, feeling completely well, completely revascularized with arguably the best of both worlds. So it's really incredible because some patients, we would previously say, uh, you know, you have complex heart disease, maybe your lungs aren't so good, you're not going to be able to tolerate doing this incision. So we've gone from saying no to people to saying yes to just about everybody and being able to do combined approaches, minimally invasive heart surgery. Of course, I understand what it is because I recruited a Perot's from Leipzig. Um, but doing that together with you, it's the combination, it's the team approach to right. select what's the, the best treatment. So I have a question for you, actually. So on the subject of recruitment, because one of the things that struck me coming here from the United States is a, a massive center like the Peterman Cardiac Center, where we have access to so many experts, must mean that you actually have to have a vision of what you're trying to build. Tell me about the vision that that pushed you to recruit the people you have. And in particular, I'd love to hear why I had the privilege and why Perros has, has the privilege and why we have the privilege of working with one another. So it's a really interesting question. And I would say that my response um, has, has, it's evolved over time. So when I started in this role, it was just get the best people, uh, the best technicians, the ones who are world leading. but it's evolved such that that's absolutely necessary, but I also look for people that I think are gonna work well in a team-based environment, that are going to embrace every challenge, that are passionate about the work. It can't just be, I'm gonna do this and then I'm gonna go home. This is not just a job. It may sound a little corny, but it's not. We deal with people's lives every day and lots of people can sew, in, sew an artery or put in a stent. Lots of people worldwide. How do you find the people that are truly passionate about this, that have their own vision? So what I like to do is find people that are like that and then create environments 
with the help of financing from the government of Ontario and our philanthropic community who provide donations that allow us to do things like the cath lab that you work in, that was largely funded through philanthropic support. Uh, and we have, I think you would agree, as good equipment as any place on earth. So it's building environments for people to be successful in and having people that are passionate about their work and want to work in a team-based approach. That's sort of the, the, for me, that's the guiding principles. And I don't know how this just flipped around to you doing the interviewing, but uh, well, I'm going to flip it back. <laughs> no, 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 I, I just, just to, that, that, that's great learning for me as someone who's trying to learn from the people who've, who've built such a great center. This is a culture thing, isn't it? Right. The answer is never no. It's okay. How, how do we get this done? And, and that to me is, I think what makes me happiest to be here. And it's, we try and reflect that where the patients are concerned. We never want to say no to a patient. The hardest thing is, you know, being a physician is to say to a patient, I'm sorry, I don't think we can do anything. Let's just watch. That's sort of code for, well, it's the end of the road and we have nothing to offer you. So I like to think of us as being the center that can always provide some option for patients. Now, let me, uh, let me move on. Um, we have a question about the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Has it impacted patients with heart disease? And more specifically, I understand that COVID is actually causing heart disease in some patients. So you get over the COVID symptoms, the lung type issues, the fever, the headaches, and then longer term, there's this very significant increase in heart disease that we're seeing. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's one of those really unfortunate and unexpected, but very true statements. Um, ultimately, when you look at COVID and the effect that it's had on cardiac care in the pandemic, there's actually a registry called the NACME registry that is being led as a combined effort between the Canadian Association of Interventional Cardiologists and the Society of Coronary Angiography and Interventions in the United States, where we're looking at heart attacks that happen in the setting of COVID and as a result of COVID, because these, these particular heart attacks have certain features, lots and lots of clot, for example, and, and the ways in which they present uh, that are leading us to understand heart attacks themselves in all settings a little bit better. One of the things we've noticed though in the setting of the pandemic is that people are staying home and not seeking care as early as perhaps they should. And this is having a real effect on outcomes. There is a, a drop in the rate of acute heart attacks that we're seeing because people aren't presenting to hospital. And instead, there's a rise in the rate of patients coming in very sick with the complications of untreated heart attacks. And so that's where it's important for us to make sure we remember to listen to our bodies. If something is wrong, you'll know it's wrong. It's time to come in and get checked out. As far as getting over COVID goes, and heart disease after COVID, what a terrible situation to be in. And there are a variety of heart, heart disease types that can occur during COVID. After COVID, we've heard a lot about this concept of long, haul, long haulers, long haul COVID, where one of the primary symptoms is, short, is shortness of breath. Now, not all shortness of breath and not all chest pain is heart related, but there is a variety of conditions that can actually come up after COVID that can be affecting that can affect the heart but that may not necessarily be directly linked to the heart something for example called POTS or postural orthostatic tachycardia it's actually a nerve problem but what it does is dysregulate it changes the body's ability to regulate heart rate and blood pressure when lying down versus when standing up and thankfully we have experts here that can help us manage those types of problems but but the the bottom line is the pandemic has done a lot to cardiac care and i think it's important for us all to get back to focus to providing the best cardiac care we can so i really want to ask you about the differences in the canada and the u.s healthcare system from your perspective but there's a few uh, i'll say relatively more technical questions that we've been asked sure. um so what are your thoughts on using ivl which is intravascular lithotripsy that's this people may be familiar with using high frequency sound waves to blast kidney stones apart this is the same thing doing it in a hard artery yep. what are your thoughts on doing that if somebody's had a stent and the stent didn't 
expand enough because there was calcium that was blocking it. So you have um, an unsatisfactory technical result. Yeah, that's a that's a great technical question. The the bottom line with doing good heart artery fixes using stents is you've got to prepare the vessel very well, right? And that's why we use intervascular imaging, and that's why we use uh, what are called atherectomy technologies, the drills that can drill out or core out the calcium. Sometimes when the stents are put in before a vessel is perfectly prepared, the calcium that would ordinarily crack behind a high pressure balloon inflation when we're putting stents in doesn't crack. And as a result, you get an area of what we call under expansion in stents. IVL is one of the ways that calcium can be addressed, just as you mentioned, by cracking the calcium in the walls. When you can do that indeed inside stents and even inside fresh stents, because most of the time, the sound waves that are emanating from the balloon that is actually imparting sound energy onto the calcium is emanating from within the stent, but on the other side from the polymer, right? The, the part that, where the drug sits, okay? Uh, a lot of the concern comes up around whether or not you can use these types of therapies in fresh stents because you might injure the drug inside or on the outside of the stent that is meant to keep the stent from scarring in. Mm -hmm. And the reality is there isn't a ton of real data about those particular questions just yet. But our experience shows us that using intravascular lithotripsy, which is a technology that, as you know, is funded largely by philanthropic funds and by the hospital because they believe in doing the right thing, that, that this is a very effective therapy for this problem but we have to be careful when and how to use it. So um, I, I think it's important for everybody to understand that we have this toolkit, I'll call right. it. So we can use these very specialized balloons. We can use devices to measure blood flow inside arteries. We can take pictures inside arteries with cameras. We can right. use a high frequency ultrasound, lots of different approaches that we can use. Another question, so you have, a, you have a, a plaque inside an artery and it's really hard. You know, I operated on arteries for 25 years. That's what it's like. Mm -hmm. What happens to that plaque after you crack it or you laser it? Where's yeah. it go? That's a great question. So, so when you are treating calcified plaque, right? So let's say you use one of the various atherectomy technologies or drills, if you will, that we have at our disposal. Then the drills themselves can spin at a variety of different speeds. The orbital atherectomy when it's spinning at high speed is 125,000 times a minute. Rotoblader, which is a slightly different atherectomy technology, can spin much faster than that, 200, 220,000 times a minute. And what ends up happening is that the actual crud, if you will, the, the calcium gets liquefied into tiny particles that actually are able to enter the heart's microvascular system, the tiny, tiny arteries that you can't even see, where it passes through and eventually gets digested by the, the body's cells that chew up this type of crud, if you will, or washed through and out of the system by just the flow of blood. But that's the secret, right? That's the magic, is knowing how to use these devices appropriately and safely so that whatever is atherectomized is actually appropriately liquefied so that arteries don't get plugged by crud as you, as you called it and patients still get very good results. Perfect. So I'm sensitive to the time. Um, every other question that we received, we're gonna post online at uhn.ca slash PMCC. But I do wanna go back to the Canada US question. Maybe I'll narrow it a little bit. So you were the first fellow at the hugely prestigious Columbia University, New York Presbyterian site to be a high risk procedures fellow. So they picked you to do this first out of, I'm sure there were tons of applicants. And then you went to Einstein in Philadelphia, a world-class center, and now you're here. Why'd you come back? As if there was a choice. I mean, you know, I, I'm very proud to be Canadian. I'm from Canada, and so it's always wonderful to come home. But as someone who was an early trainee in a new space, in a new subspecialty of what we do, what you really need is a place to go where your leaders are visionaries, and they've got your back. 
They're going to support you to do what you do. Recognize where you need help and help you. Recognize where you need structure and put it behind you. And that's what Peter, the Peter Mon Cardiac Center is. I mean, I have the best surgical colleagues to work with at any time. I have the very best heart failure transplant colleagues to work with at any time. In the largest transplant center in Canada, I have the availability of the biggest and most developed calcium toolbox in all of Canada. I have mechanical circulatory support devices, et cetera. And I have a group of leaders that believe in me and believe in what our mission is, which is to have the most positive impact on patients. Ultimately, that makes it a really easy choice. I loved my time in the US. I have many dear, dear friends there. I will always think of that place as a special place that will always be near and dear but I'm very happy to be here. So a great answer, thank you. And I'd also like to thank um, our division heads who helped make this possible. Dr. Heather Ross, uh, head of cardiology and Dr. Morale Azunian, who we just appointed as the first, as the head of uh, cardiac surgery at UHN. Amazing. So, so that was really fun. I enjoyed thank talking you. with you. Um, uh, our offices, for those who don't know, are actually about 30 feet away, but we're appearing in uh, different spaces. So that was great. And I also appreciate everybody who sent in questions, uh, which, as I said, we'll answer online. And again, my appreciation to the wonderful donors that support the Peter Monk Cardiac Center. Uh, the reality is that there are devices that Health Canada approves. And then it takes two, three years for the government of Ontario to say, OK, we're going to fund that technology, but we can't wait. So we use funds from donors to be able to provide the absolute best state-of-the-art calcium toolbox, like you described, uh, technologies for the patients that we serve. Uh, this has been great. Uh, this is the first of many of these type of online forums that we're going to be conducting. Thank you to everybody who joined us. And please stay safe and let's uh, ride out the end of this pandemic and hopefully return to very normal life very soon. Have a good evening. Have a good evening, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us.